Thanks, man. Can everyone hear me? Today, today, I, I you know this this theme of connect, connection is very, very close to my heart. So this is not a commercial talk for me. This is not no one's paid me to do this. This is something that I'm actually quite passionate about, and something that I spend a lot of my time researching and evolving as a as a theme, which I'm hoping to put into a book later this year, early next year. Uh, so connection for me is actually not connection; it's 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 reconnection. And I'll explain why, because I actually think that what we're in the process right now is rebuilding bonds that haven't existed for maybe 60 or 70 years. So what I actually did to make, to make this talk possible, I've built a time machine. You know, I had it manufactured in China and I crowdsourced it and put it on Kickstarter, got money and brought it down here. And it's in this room. You can't see it, but it's actually going to help our journey today. Is for the, so the, for, the, for the first part of this, we're going to go back to the 1970s. <coughs> The 70s is a very important turning point in defining where we are today. Why? Because it's the first time we saw technology. This is actually what a computer looked like in the 1970s. Now, who, who, did anyone ever own one of those? No, that's right. Um, so the idea is when technology crept into our lives, we started communicating through new mediums, through the first likes of email, through the first versions of Telnet and, 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 and so forth, the, you know, the creation of even TCIP, actually started to change the way that we communicate on a daily basis. And it actually happened, what happened is a, is a crazy movement. We had this thing in the 1980s called globalization. Does anyone remember what, what, what globalization? It was this fantastic, sexy thing that was going to save us all, it's going to make brands go everywhere and, and change the world. All of a sudden, brands like Coca-Cola and Samsung and so forth didn't have to have, you know, the idea of having a complete operations in one country. They could have central operations in headquarters or have various components around the world that would be leveraged at a, global, at a global level. Now, this was great for sort of optimizing business and it was great for shareholder value. But what it did is actually radically changed how brands around the world interacted with their, with their consumer base. And what actually happened in, in particularly is in parallel to this was we saw the evolution of more consumer tech. So businesses got tech in the 80s, we got tech in the 90s. We saw Game Boys come to the, to, to the, to the, to the, the, the foray. We saw digital cameras come in, mobile phones. You know, all this tech became, it was only new in the 1990s. You know, the first uh, digital camera took 0.3 megapixels, a fraction of what your, your, your iPhone can do today, and could only store 10 photos. That, that's crazy. You know, like, that's, how do we get that far? But what, what, what all this tech did is that once businesses had tech, and we had tech, how do we communicate? What actually happened is the face of most businesses around the world looked like this. India, Mexico, and the Philippines became hotbeds for massive pools of people to sit on the telephone 24 hours a day to be the face of a brand, to be the single point of contact for how you contact Dell, how you contact Samsung, how you contact your bank. You have a problem with your watch? Call India. And how did this make us feel? Well, actually, it wasn't great. For the first time in history, around about 1998, just prior to the, the, the dot-com boom, we became the most disconnected generation in history. We became isolated. Our relationships were no longer fruitful and meaningful. They were very transactional, one time, and relationships basically decayed to a point where we became an unloyal generation of consumers. They blame Gen Y as being unloyal and very, you know, will change relationships very fast. And the reality is that this, the very reason for this is the idea of globalization and the dehumanization of relationships. So this is what came straight after that. Businesses actually thought this was good. They actually thought the dehumanization of relationships was powerful. So some very, very wealthy people threw large amounts of money at ventures like Webvan, $800 million dollars the very first version of Redmart, basically, back in 2001, that went down the drain because consumers weren't ready for this yet. Ventures that, you know, I mean, look at these numbers. There's two here that are close to $800 million that went down the drain in around that period in 2001 because we weren't quite ready for this whole dehumanization of relationships. This is who came out of it, the tech diva. Now I think there's, I could count, I think there's up to about 180,000 Tech Diva blogs, which they call Tech Diva. They are girls that have tech 
and they talk about it online, whether it's their mobile phone, their Instagram feeds, their, what they're doing on their laptop, and they'll do everything from sell handbags to bracelets to t-shirts to sunglasses and get paid to do this. There's, there's dozens of these in Singapore. Even more disconnected than ever before because they do this from their home. And yes, they would have a, have a community, but they would very rarely see these, pe these people face to face. So this was great for the tech diva, but not so great for everyone else. And what actually happened is we started changing how we walk down the street. No longer do we walk down the street and, hi, how you going? Eyes, look at people, nod. This is how we walk down the street now. This is how most people are in a restaurant today. I had a very shocking experience in uh, La Bichon down on, down on uh, Robinson Key. I walked, who knows La Bichon, by the way? It's a reasonably high-priced French restaurant in Robinson Key. Walking past the front of it, and here was a guy on his iPad playing Angry Birds at the table. It's like, are you serious? Is that what we've come to? Where is this human interaction? Now, your girlfriend or wife is on the other side of the table, and she's Instagramming her, 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 her little steak. It's like, is, is this what the world's come to? So interesting statistic is what actually happened, actually, is the most overwhelming case study is exactly of this. Bowling in the United States transforms. Now, I pick on bowling because it's very exoteric for a lot of people. They can't relate to it. But bowling is actually a very popular sport in the United States. Back, in, back prior to the, to, to the dot-com boom and a connected era, some 80 million people bowled at least five times a year in the US. That's a lot of people, you know, that's 20% that's of the population. But what happened through the dot-com era, more people bowled and during from 1998 to 2008, the number of people bowling grew by 37%. But the number of bowling leagues, so where we actually have a coordinated way where we all get together and actually compete or socialize, which you've probably seen in a number of movies, actually decreased by 42%. So people started bowling alone more and more and more. And that spread is massive. In fact, in the end, the gap was, was, a, was a swing of something like 50 million people over, to, over a 10-year period. That's a huge swing to say, coming out of a simple activity like bowling. So what actually happened at the end of the result is we have the most disconnected generation in history, which peaked at around 2004. Our isolation levels were at a point that were astronomical. As our, as our smartphones became even smarter, we got even more disconnected. All of a sudden we're saying we're looking at this screen as opposed to looking at people around us. Something had to change. We had all had this overwhelming desire to reconnect. I can almost guarantee, and I'm not going to ask anyone to put their hands up, but I guarantee in that period of 2004 to 2008, a lot of us would have felt lonely. And the statistics were overwhelming. Depression is at, a high new, at, at one of the highest points in history. Even though we had no war, no depression. It was even prior to the financial crisis. Yet we were, we, we were depressed through loneliness. And then we hit a tipping point. In 2008, things started to change. We had a demand, we had a desire to reconnect with people. We actually wanted to speak to the person in the lift while we were going, going up. Actually, who here? Who here would speak to a stranger in a lift? Mm, I actually reckon the actual numbers is low on the hands, but... <laughs> is it's, it's actually quite scary that we've gotten to a point where we can stand next to someone in a lift for 30 or 60 seconds and not say a word to them, maybe not even make eye contact, which is a very scary thing for around how we connect with humans, how we humanise our interactions. So what actually happened in 2008 was that desire to connect and collaborate. And there was a trend that actually came. Who can actually guess what happened in 2008 that actually started to turn the corner? Crowdsourcing, maybe, yeah, it's one part of it. Sorry, yeah, sorry? Social media. Social media. Social media was one of the biggest impacts. It's all of a sudden we had these platforms that we had to sort of adapt to. Now, in 2008, we weren't, being, we weren't humanizing our connectivity and our interactions. We were just getting to know this stuff. For a lot of people in 2008, they would still say, I'm not getting onto Facebook. Why would I? In fact, actually, who here in 2008 swore black and blue they would not go onto Facebook? Leave your hand up if you still do not have Facebook. <laughs> it's, it was the same with mobile phones actually back in the mid 90s as a lot of people swore black and blue I am never getting a mobile phone I do not want to be connect I don't want to be uh, contacted 24 7 at my home on my way to work and actually a large percentage of those people today now have mobile phones same with Facebook there's actually a large percentage of people in fact I think the numbers are actually around the high 40% that said I will never ever get Facebook 
and a high percentage of those people now have it and actually use it. So what happened from 2008 is a number of platforms actually helped us collaborate, communicate in new ways. And it's still evolving today. Like it's a, we're only you know, five, six years into this journey. And we're still adapting to it and learning to it. But the things that actually started to create here is the idea of authenticity and transparency. Two trends which, depending on your, your, your opinion, can either be very positive or very negative. Is through this generation, we started to become authentic in the way that we were willing to show the world 100% of who we are. Something that we hadn't done since the, mid, since the mid 70s. We weren't prepared to let everyone know what parties we went to on the weekend or what concert we went to at night. Did we go out drinking on Tuesday on, on, on a school night? Those kind of things. Everyone got very scared. You can't put a photo up on your Facebook or your employer will find you. But over the time, this, we were accepting this more and more and more to say that we are authentic. And actually, the Dotting Hill thing is actually a really cool thing because there was a, you know, not, that, not that long ago, tattoos were unacceptable. A lot of things have become were unacceptable over time and have evolved. Transparency is one of those things, just like tattoos or the green movement or you know, gay marriage in the US right now. Is the idea is these are, these are concepts that start with a very, very small community and drive acceptance over a period of time. So the idea where you get to where I am today is I am 100% transparent. If any of you try to frame me on Facebook, I will likely accept. Why? Because I'm not scared of who I am. I'm, I'm of a generation that's totally open to people understanding who I am. That means something to me as a human. So what, what, as, this, as this proliferates through society, we have dialogues happening in these, in these worlds as well. We start exchanging what we like, what we dislike. We start helping collaborate in terms of uh, crowdsourcing and Kickstarter and, and various platforms that actually say, okay, it doesn't matter how exoteric your interest is. It doesn't matter if you're into temporary tattoos or weaving uh, coconut leaf baskets underwater. There is a group out there in the world where you can connect as a community in a way that you never could previously. So you can have the most, you may think you have the most crazy unique interest that you're never willing to share with your family. But there's a million other people out there in the world that actually have the same interest. And it's a matter of how do we connect those people to create the new communities. You know, previously we were bound by physical, geograph uh, physical geography. And in the new world we can say based on digital geography. Is it, okay, yeah, you, you want to weave baskets underwater, but there's this guy in Mexico that also loves doing that. And you can get together and you can collaborate and do projects and share photos and videos on how you weaved it in salt water or fresh water or we used leaves from the Caribbean or from the South Pacific and it came out in this really cool way and I dyed, I dyed the leaves pink or I you know, gave a special treatment. Is that, that becomes the passion of that community, the way those people interact at a very human level because these people have found a way to be authentic and transparent. So we've got a couple of case studies here that are actually really pushing the envelope. Does actually anyone recognize these two guys? This is Adam and Charlie, who started Cora. Cora is one of the biggest Q&A platforms on the platform today, where people get a chance to say, no matter how unique or challenging your question is, I'm pretty sure their platform has an answer. And it literally could be techniques for how do, you, how do we have South Pacific coconut leaves in Mexico. And I'm pretty sure you might find an answer. Uh, in, in Estonia, you know, of all places in the world, we started seeing communities collaborate as well and connect human lives. Is it, uh, actually, anyone here know about the Let's Do It movement in, in Estonia? Oh, this is awesome. So Let's Do It is an, one of the world's best case studies on what I call collaborative consumption in the digital space. Is a group of volunteers, not unlike the group that, ha that coordinates Creative Mornings here, took six months off out of their careers to go around and photograph all of the rubbish and waste in Estonia. All they did was photograph it, put it up onto a website, and then nine months later actually put a call to action to the community to how do we fix this as, 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 a, as a community together. Within the, within the first 12 months, they were actually able to get 4% of Estonia's population, 1.3 million people, to take an entire day out to clean up all this, all this trash. If you scale this, this would be 50 million people in the United States. Like These are big numbers that are able to move. Let's do it is now an annual movement where people go around literally on, on their community photographing, I think, you know, there's trash under scape, there's trash behind the hub, there's trash in the aqueduct down the corner, and it becomes basically a task list of where we're going to clean stuff up. And then the community's idea is to say, okay, I ticked off, I cleaned up under the scape, and here it is afterwards. So you have a before and after photo for every single location. Awesome movement of how, how, we, con how we congregate as a community. Zappos sort of raised the benchmark on 
how digital businesses can have a relationship with a consumer. They actually started having relationships with you not dissimilar to the shoe guy you used to have in your, in your local town. They would interact with you, create a relationship, and over time, you, you, you turn to these guys time and time again because they learnt, got to know you. They got to know your size, your family, your community, your preferences and choices, which actually enriched that in relationship at a whole new level. Amazon does this in, in some degree with, with their, you know, their suggests, but Zappos is at a whole new level. Spotify is exactly the same. I mean, there's, a, there's a number of a number of music businesses around the world that learn you over time, but Spotify, what it did is it actually was one of the very first in the world to deepen the relationship of understanding what is your taste profile. They have an awesome database behind their behind their um, engine called EcoNest out of Boston, which is one of the largest uh, big data projects on the planet. It actually goes through your music to understand what is your taste preference, what songs do you listen to frequently. What emotions do we think you're actually feeling when you listen to certain songs? What's the tempo? Do you listen to a whole song, a part song? What playlist do you subscribe to? To build a taste profile over time so that their recommendations get more and more enriching every single time. It's actually, who, who, who here uses Spotify? It's only been in Singapore a few months, but it's an, you know, the data behind that is phenomenal. Uh, if you ever get a chance, look up a company called EcoNest and you'll understand how they're starting to humanize your music experience beyond just the transactional idea of buying music. It's making music a relationship and an ongoing, ongoing relationship. Econest, E C H O N E S T. Another interesting case study is around causal scale in, in amongst our communities. Uh, everyone familiar with, with Kony 2012? So Kony was basically, let's say, a, a bad man uh, and he did some bad things. Uh, but basically, some people didn't like what he did uh, and actually created a small. Uh, film, digital film they've actually shared on social media, which was actually saying that on a particular day they were going to push officials to arrest him because he'd evaded arrest over decades. Uh, and what they were able to do is, throughout the whole world, create causal scale, both online and offline, to say we have, six, I think it was 65 million people in the, in the space of nine months actually were saying we want this guy arrested. And they put pressure on Interpol, they put pressure on, on the UN to have this guy brought to justice even though he sat in a nation which he was reasonably protected through the frameworks of society. Anyone recognize this? This is one of the very first properties on Airbnb. Believe it or not, I mean, Airbnb actually was quite quirky at the start. There was teepees and air mattresses, and this guy had his, his airplane cubby house. Uh, but it was real, Airbnb really tried to enrich the idea of authenticity and transparency to build real relationships. So that in, when you go to Barcelona, instead of staying in the W or staying in the Hilton, you would stay in someone's house. Maybe get even get a proper a proper Spanish meal. Learn from the locals. And it's really humanising that, that 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 relationship. So Airbnb today is thriving purely on that. And I have a big belief that the idea of these uh, collaborative consumption ideas will actually bring human interaction back to the way that we do a lot of things in our life, including travel and accommodation. So, what do all these have in common? What are the points that, you, that we need to take away to inject into our own projects, business, the work we're working on, our passions, to leverage the same case studies? And the things are actually really, really simple. What these guys do is not rocket science. It's existed before in history, we just need to figure it out. So the first one is greet people by name. Hi, I'm Scott. You know, if, if you're going to interact with someone and they're coming back for the second time, recognize that I'm Scott. One of my pet hates in Singapore is Singapore Airlines. Anyone that sees me on social media, I complain about them a lot. Um, <laughs> but like, I, I've been with Singapore Airlines ever since I came here you know, five and a half years ago. I've dialed them from the same mobile phone number every single time. Yet every single time I dial them, they go one for, Ch one for Chinese, two for English. I'm like, why? I've called from the same number for five years. How do you not know that I speak English by now? How, can, how do you not greet me by, by my name? Hi, Scott, welcome back. That is actually very, very easy technology today of doing call number identification. Oh, Scott, you speak English, welcome back. Yes, it's okay if you authenticate me, that's fine, but greet me by name when I walk in the door. Don't keep, keep making me feel like this is a first time interaction. Listen, to, oh, that's actually really bad in this projector, but that says listen. It is every time you interact with someone, pay attention to what they're telling you, both informal and, off and informal cues, body language, facial expression, 
if you're in the digital space, look at their browsing behavior, their flow behavior. Is there the things they do like and don't like? Do they, have, do they express certain opinions? Pay attention to this stuff because it's actually going to be very, very valuable in terms of how you give value back to that, that, that interaction. Because once you learn, and you said, so this says pay attention to learn, you can collect this over and over and over and over again. So this is what Spotify and Zappos are doing very well, is they are learning from what, while they're listening. So that over a period of relationship, they know Scott, they know his preferences. They know that there's no point giving me six inch stilettos. There's no point giving me you know, deals on certain things because they're just you know, not worthwhile to me. Like one of my, one of my, one of my frustrations here is, like we, we all know Groupon, we all love deals in Singapore. But who, else, who gets those emails every day? It's kind of like you know, beauty products and waxing for a 65 year old guy or you know, gadgets for someone that's never been on technology. It's, how, can have, how, how can they have not learned who you are and your preferences? They know what you've bought, they know what you've browsed. Why can't they make that a little bit more contextual and actually add value to that relationship? <coughs> the next one is always be suggestive. So once you actually think you know something about someone, start saying, okay, oh, based on your past, the past information I have from you, I think you might like this, this spa deal. Or I think you know, you've got an interest in 16 stilettos. Well, here's a deal on some from Charles, Charles and Keith. Instead of putting it in their face of saying, okay, look, it's just transactional, we're going to throw deals in your face all the time. It's actually start saying, okay, we're going to add value to this relationship. And it doesn't matter if you're online or offline. Once you know someone, you have the ability to suggest things. One of those crazy things out there is we're actually all inherently lazy. We like suggestions. When we walk into a shoe store and we think the person who works there is a little bit more experienced and understanding of how shoes work, what's the latest style, we'll ask their opinion. We want their opinion. Businesses like Zappos and Spotify are always suggesting. Every time you come to them, they'll suggest something to help you encourage the engagement and enrich that, that relationship. And the last point is always be appreciative. Sorry, these colors are actually terrible on this projector. They look cool on my, on my Mac. My Mac's at the back there if you want to look there. <laughs> um, is always be appreciative of the relationship you have with that client. Say thank you in an authentic way, not in a McDonald's way, in an authentic way. <laughs> There's this guy, Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, you know, the guys in Bali, I've shown you him several times this week, is he, he's famous for a book called The Thank You Economy. And it literally is about saying thank you for your, to your customers or the people in your life for them being there, whether it's commercially or personally. Be appreciative, express that, because that softens a relationship and enriches it to a whole new level. Funnily enough, these principles have existed before, so we're going to jump back in my time machine and we're going back to the 1920s. Prior to the Second World War, prior to technology, prior to everything we know as, as normal. To show you that this is not about new connections, this is about reconnections. We have a whole generation in between, mainly baby boomers and Gen X, that have, will miss the connections that, that, that the Gen Ys and millennials will benefit from over the next decade. Back prior to the Second World War, we all lived in small towns. The idea of expats and communications technology and traveling the world was a totally foreign concept. Yes, there was a few people traveling the world, but not at the same scales today. It would very, be very unlikely that we'd be able to get, you know, the results from the, the Madrid-Barcelona game from last night, this morning, until it came through on some kind of news feed or newspaper one or two days later. Real-time results were just not possible. So we had all these human interactions to get things in, in, our, in our world. We usually had consumed most of our relationships or our commercial relationships within one to five kilometers of our home. If you had a car, it could be a little bit further. But what actually happened is we, guess what? We spoke to people. Back in the 1920s and 30s, we actually knew our bank manager. We knew them by name and they knew us by name. Statistically, you invited your bank manager to your wedding because he was your friend, but also because very soon after your wedding, you're probably going to want to borrow money off him to buy a house. <laughs> but that relationship was there. You didn't have to prove to him that I was Scott, that I was authentic. You didn't have to go through those massive forms just to prove my identity. He already knew you. Your butcher. Who still goes to a butcher? A few of us. Because, you know, back in the 20s and 30s, you knew your butcher's name. He knew your, your wife, your kids, your birthdays, and on your birthday, he might give you an extra, an extra tray of sausages. He'd greet you by name. He'd learn you over time, and he'd make suggestions. Try my new sport, uh, spicy pork sausages. Or, you know, your husband might like this great cut, this great ribs have just, just got in. 
and he's that, he built that relationship over time. Because he also knew that if he gave you something you didn't like or a bad batch of meat, you told your friends. And in that small town, one bad experience could virally spread very, very fast and be catastrophic to his business. Same with your greengrocer. You would go there, they'd tell you about what's in season, what's great, what's not good, maybe a recipe or a salad idea to do with the vegetables they've just gotten in. That was a relationship, a human interaction. Again, they knew you, you knew them by name, you greeted each other, they maybe throw in some freebies because they like you. Oh, we've got a surplus of tomatoes today, we'll give you an extra half dozen tomatoes. Real human relationships that have long existed that in the, in the marketplaces and, the, and so forth of today don't exist. The supermarkets can't give you an extra tomato. It's against policy. And more than likely, the checkout chick that you had today is not the same one you're going to get next week. Very rarely today do we get the same human each time we go to a supermarket. Similarly, that baker. These relationships over and over and over again. We said we spoke about the shoe store, the grocer, the banker, all these people that are, probably still exist. Their services still exist in your life today. It's just the relationship has changed over time. And the, the opportunities in business today are how do we reconnect these relationships? The case studies that I like to point to is farmers markets in the United States. Farmers markets since 2008 have grown exponentially year on year, something like 850%. They now out, they, there's now more um, farmers markets in the United States than there are Walmarts. People are choosing to have those human, those human relationships again. So they can go to meet someone and say, how's the carrots this week? How's the tomatoes this week? Anything you can suggest for a salad. Now that's, that's very enriching human experiences that we're reconnecting, both digitally and in person. You know, I, you know, we've got Pasabella up in, up in Turf City, but I actually anticipate we'll see more of these kind of farmers markets coming back to this part of the world as well, because Asia loves markets. Now you have to go to Tekka to realize the chaos there, so that, that, that thing will scale very, very quickly and it's going to come back into our lives. We will turn away from you know, the, the fair prices and the NTUCs very soon to go back to real human interactions. So my time machine is going to bring us back. That's back to, to, back to today, back to the real world, and say so that we all have an opportunity to say a preference around reconnecting those relationships that we previously didn't have. To look to these case studies of in your life of where are you making connections you haven't made before, where you're actually executing those principles of greet people by name. Listen, learn, and appreciate. You know, the businesses of tomorrow that will thrive, particularly over the next decade, will leverage those four principles. So that's all I had today. I don't know how I am on time. I am over or under? Um, do we do six minutes over? Wow. That's actually pretty good for me. <laughs> Um, do we do questions? Yes. Okay, cool. Thanks for the awesome, awesome presentation. Um, I'm just wondering if the time machine goes forward as well, um, beyond here, because um, I see so many big faceless corporations that have absolutely a kind of autistic, you know, innovative to communicate with people, like the big banks, the supermarkets, the places like that, and they just compete on price. Yep. Um, do you think that those huge organizations are just going to slowly die, um, or are they going to sort of continue in parallel while we sort of revel in our connected economies and relationships and things like that? Yeah, it's a really good question. This is one I get asked a lot when I'm talking about a lot of my futurism work. It, it, the reality is, right, yes, as we have a, a stronger and stronger desire for more human relationships, they will either have to pivot their core business to go away from transactional business to relationship-based business, or they will face dying. I mean, the reality is, is all you have to look at the various businesses that have gone out of, out of business in the last six years. Uh, I mean, Blockbuster is a great example. Is Blockbuster was very transactional. I mean, yes, they got disintermediated by a technology override of like iTunes and Spotify, but they still had a very transactional relationship with you. Occasionally, you might get to know the guy at your local Blockbuster to recommend the, the, the DVD. But the reality was that the enriching experience, the reason you would go to the store, was no longer there. It was literally competing, it's like Video Easy versus Blockbuster, which one's gonna be cheaper? Because the product is not any different if the, if the relationship is, is not is gonna be the same. So yes, there is a, a strong tendency pushing towards the idea of more enriching relationships. So I just built a bank in the, U, the United States called Movin, which is exactly based on that, that premise. That the, the relationship of the bank in your life will change, particularly over the next decade, because they're not demonstrating understanding. 
They're not building a relationship with you. They're not learning from you. They're not appreciating. So I actually think that a lot of industries will be overrun by that and be replaced by relationships that are a lot more meaningful. And do you think Google can sustain that when it's the 80 million customers? Uh, yeah, I mean, Zappos does today. I mean, Zappos has a large scale. So the, the idea is if you build the right foundations internally around the culture and how you interact with, with people, and it becomes more authentic. One of the biggest challenges in corporates today is how they do communications is the way they, they talk with a, with a customer is controlled. It's a process, it's a script. You don't have to go to McDonald's or Singapore Airlines to understand that firsthand. Is you go off script and they're like, whoa, whoa, hey, hang on a second here. I can't talk on this stuff. Let's do, I've got to go back to head office to get approval to talk about why my countertop is gray. Um, or you want chili sauce with your fries? Mm, yeah, no, no, it's not, we can't do that. Um, is those kind of brands, their, their DNA is in transactional relationships. And they've thrived on that. I mean, McDonald's has thrived on uh, predictable transactional relationships. So you can go anywhere in the world and a Big Mac is a Big Mac. Okay, the fries change in by, city by city and so forth, but a Big Mac remains pretty much the same because the, re the recipe for the experience and the product is literally cookie, cut cookie cutter. But our desire as a community is gonna shift away from that. We'll be more likely to go to the, the chain, or it, it, it could be a chain that actually creates value in the relationship, that recognizes you when you come through the door. And the technology exists to do this. I don't want to go all minority report on you, but actually, everyone's seen the movie Minority Report? The idea that we can be identified by our irises? That technology exists today. Now, I know privacy and security concerns might make this kind of scary, but there is nothing stopping businesses today of putting some kind of face technology or iris technology as you walk through the front door to say, welcome back, Scott. And you'd be surprising how far that would go if they greeted me by name every time I walked in the front door. But so yes, it can scale. Yeah, but so, you need to put, so you need to put pressure. But the reality is, is it's their own choice. We don't have to put pressure on them. We will speak with our dollars. Okay? Is if they decide not to follow that, that's their own choice. If they choose to die, I'm not going to sit around and save them like the U.S. government saved those banks. Okay, if they choose to be suicidal, that's their own choice. So, so I think the whole concept of the recognized by us sort of picture and being greeted by Australia for a really good reason. Okay. And so I actually wonder if there was a time we want to think of human relationships like this in the ocean. I think there's a time where you were just sort of transactional. Yep. Uh, and yes, we can collect data about people, so I suppose us relatively transactional. But, you know, we, we kind of need to be sensitive about where things are more aligned around, you know, uh, you know close interaction. Yes, I definitely agree. There's, there's going to be times for relationship and transactional interactions. Totally agree. And there's parts where if you walk into a little like to a convenience store like a 7-Eleven, you just to buy a Coke or a pack of smokes or to top up your cash card, you probably don't want them recognizing you. That's 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 granted. Um, but we will vote as a community as to when we do and we don't want that. One of the, one of the overwhelming statistics, and this is for this is a, a gen, I don't want to be generational, but Gen Y, so anyone sort of under the age of 32 right now, actually has a higher acceptance of transparency than older generations. They, their actual their default is tra being transparent. On the one condition, that you have to get value back for it as well. You can't just get collect data for the sake of collecting data to do you know, cross-selling or marketing campaigns or to sell the data to the next, next agency. You actually have to see immediate real value. So that if I give you access to my Facebook profile or to my, my facial scan, is that you show that you're actually using that for a valuable reason to enrich that relationship. And that will be the key differentiator for us accepting it or, or actually declining it. Questions? Anyone else? I would ask a question, just don't know how to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so just be, just go ad lib. Yeah, so basically, I'm thinking about free education. You just submit a few videos all about learning stuff for free from people that know about stuff, like you or an expert or something. But what, what is your prediction about this connectivity, how people will get educated in the future? Okay, so awesome question. I love this question. Uh, it goes in, and I call it the idea of collaborative, collaborative consumption. And what you're asking around education is not new. It's happening already. And the two case studies I always like to refer to are Skillshare. Uh, so Skillshare is the idea of, think of eBay for, eBay for education. So I have a skill, you have a skill, and what you do is you make, make it available to the world. Uh, I'm going to teach it on a certain topic. So like on September 25, I'm doing a two-hour workshop on lean startup methods here in Singapore at, at Microsoft. 
Anyone can sign up. I'm, I'm a freelance expert, which my, my, my expertise is either uh, verified or denied by the community. Um, you know, I can't put a certification on you, but the people that come will review me and, and say whether I'm credible or not. And you'll learn from me on those methods. Similarly, there's also Coursera. Is Coursera new to everyone? Or? So Coursera is actually taking the curriculum of most of the US Ivy League schools, Ivy League colleges particularly, and making those curriculums transparent and available free to everyone. So I'm actually doing a course right now with about six or seven guys from the hub on social psychology. We as a group got together and we're doing a six week course, which is actually a subject from Wesleyan University's um, psych psych social psychology degree, and we will do a free course to actually go through the same curriculum. Awesome. Th Thursday mornings, 10 a.m. at the hub, we have a group watching the lectures. Malaysia. Oh, you're in Malaysia, okay. <laughs> but the idea is education is actually a key thing, is that um, I see education being one of the biggest disruptors in the next decade, where the whole idea of elitist schools will be completely removed. The idea that you actually have a certificate or a degree from a university will probably be de decayed over the next 10 years, and all of a sudden your, your verified skills or ability will be varied by the community, not by an institution. Uh, this, this is a bit beyond the, the, the agenda of the thing, but the whole idea of what I call hierarchical order will completely be dismantled over the next two decades. And the idea is we'll have, all have what's called social capital. Our social capital is to say that, okay, you will all go away and verify whether I was good or bad today, either through Creative Mornings or through LinkedIn or through Twitter. Somehow you will, you will, collab, you will uh, contribute to my social capital. And that will be the new verifiable currency that we have to swap on who we are in the world. Which means that it's, that it's open to bringing in, in the ideas of, if I've done a course on Coursera, is that any more or any less meaningful than me doing the, so, the same course by physically going to Wesleyan? Okay, I've, I've been through the same learning experience, I've submitted the same, the same assignments. Is it just a different way of executing on the same curriculum? So there's two questions there, and I'll try and tackle them separately. First one is around PRISM. Like PRISM's actually a, a pretty high topic. Anyone that reads my blog would realise I did a massive write-up on, on Snowden and, and the Canning cases, anyway. Uh, is, what we're seeing is a huge movement towards transparency, both at the control level and at the community level. Uh, so PRISM as a, as a concept is actually kind of hard because uh, us being monitored by our governments is kind of weird because it's, we haven't yet fully, we haven't fully embraced complete transparency. If you think about PRISM from a, a younger generation of how we share data and share identity and, and our blogs, our photos, our Instagrams and so on, that generation actually embraces transparency at a different level. Then there's the Big Brother transparency, which we've seen in the PRISM case, which is very kind of controlling, what are they trying to get to idea, is that if you get to the, the core principles of PRISM, Yes, they are surveillance, but the, what they're trying to do is kind of okay. They're trying to protect you and I. The reality is, is they're trying to filter out who's the bad guys. Uh, and that's actually still a very hard thing to do because the bad guys are very good at hiding. Um, to, give you, to give you an awesome case study, which I love, is uh, after, after September 11, uh, the US put sanctions on Afghanistan and Pakistan and doing trade. So you actually, they actually, the two countries can't do commerce between the two countries because of the sanction between the two, current, the two countries. The challenge is, is before 2011, they did trade every single day. Billions of dollars crossed that border for rice, for grain, and so forth. And now what has to happen is people have to go off the grid to literally carry donkey, donkeys full of cash across the border to facilitate just the supply of rice and grain, or tobacco, or, or cotton, 
and so forth. And the reality is if we came back into an area where transparency was accepted, and I said PRISM's principles are a bit too extreme, but the reality is if you got back into a world where we could accept those flows of information and commerce, the only people left doing that kind of stuff will be the bad guys because they're trying to stay way off the grid. And it's going to get into a point in time where the only people left trying to stay off the grid will be the bad guys. The second part was of your question was on the, your DNA and, and, and so forth is, yes, that's kind of scary. I mean, I, I, have, two, I have two quantified uh, self bands on here. Uh, I'm a bit extreme. I, have, I used to have a third, but it broke. Um, is the whole idea of how do I get data on myself and who do I share that with is still very, very new. But where this could go is a whole reoptimization of how we manage preventative services, such as insurance, healthcare, and so forth. Is most people in here probably still wouldn't accept the idea is that if I could have a device on my wrist that would monitor my blood pressure, my electrolyte level, my uh, heart rate, and so forth, and give that to an insurance company, that would be quite scary for them. But what if I said your insurance premium would be 65% cheaper? And we'll also give you a service that based on that data will tell you whether you're likely to have a heart attack or a stroke in the next six to 12 months. Most people might put their hand up and start realizing that's actually quite valuable. And you're actually seeing some things going in that way right now to say that if I can use that data in a way that's actually valuable to you, you might be more willing to do it. But right now it's kind of scary because we see PRISM, we see them taking our data but giving nothing back. So I think if they tackle it in a different way of saying, okay, look, we are going to, we are going to put in surveillance but these are the reasons why, and this is the value we're creating for society. That's a very different way of tackling the same problem as opposed to doing it behind closed doors and re relying on WikiLeaks to expose it. Make sense? Great, thank you, Scott. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you.